Terror gripped Ektor's chest as the shuttle hatch opened, giving him his first glimpse of the human homeworld. The alien diplomat tried to steady his shaking hands as he emerged onto the tarmac of New York's spaceport. Sweat glistened on Ektor's green skin as he descended the ramp, greeted by a boisterous crowd of cheering Terrans. The eager smiles on the humans' faces did little to ease Ektor's anxiety as he approached the reception line, his stomach churning at the thought of the great responsibilities that lay before him. As the newly appointed Ferengi ambassador to Earth, Ektor carried the burdensome hopes of his entire species on his slim shoulders, hopes to forge a vital alliance with the greatest military and economic superpower in the known galaxy. And as an untested young diplomat with shamefully limited knowledge of human history or culture, Ektor feared that he was grossly unqualified for such a momentous task. His recent chilling encounter with a hardened Terran mercenary aboard the Starliner had only reinforced his feelings of inadequacy. The battle-scarred soldiers' grisly tales of cutting-edge human weapons wiping out entire enemy armies had left Ektor quaking in his robes. Mustering his wavering courage, Ektor forced a polite smile as he strode down the reception line, shaking hands with the assembled human dignitaries just as he'd practiced. Each glimpse of the glittering megastructures and sleek warships in orbit above only deepened Ektor's unease, hammering home just how primitive his own people were compared to the mighty Terrans. He fervently repeated his carefully memorized greeting to each official, praying to the great material continuum that he didn't accidentally mispronounce something and mortally offend his formidable hosts. Ektor knew that the future of Ferengi human relations hinged perilously on his ability to successfully ingratiate himself with Earth's intimidating power brokers. He had to secure humanity's friendship at all costs. The very fate of his defenseless people could depend on it. If Ektor failed to win the humans' trust and affection, his resource-rich but technologically outmatched civilization might find itself all too easily crushed beneath Terran boots. All he wanted was to flee back into the safety of his shuttle and rocket away from this frightening blue world. But Ektor steeled his nerves and pressed on. For the sake of the Ferengi, he had to find the strength to see this vital mission through, no matter how loudly his every instinct screamed at him to run. As the reception line finally ended, Ektor found himself ushered to a waiting podium, his hands trembling as he shuffled through his prepared remarks. He cleared his throat anxiously, the din of the gathered crowd fading to a dull roar in his ears. Ektor began to speak, but in his nervousness, the unfamiliar human words felt clumsy on his tongue. People of Earth, on behalf of the Ferengi Alliance, I come bearing arms, I mean, bearing gifts. Ektor declared with a forced smile, gesturing to an ornate vase beside him. Please accept this symbol of our desire to bury the axe between our great civilizations. Polite laughter rippled through the assembled dignitaries at Ektor's mangled idioms. Flushing with embarrassment, the young ambassador reached for the priceless porcelain vase with shaking hands. As he attempted to pass it to Earth's stony-faced president, the ancient heirloom slipped from his sweaty grasp. Time seemed to slow as the vase tumbled end over end, shattering into countless shards on the tarmac with a sickening crash. Utter silence fell over the horrified crowd. Hector stood frozen, his mouth agape in mortification at the jagged ceramic pieces littering the ground. The human president glowered at Ektor, clearly biting back a sharp remark. After a painfully awkward beat, a tall man in a tailored suit stepped forward, smoothly taking Ektor by the elbow. Mr. Ambassador, if you'll please follow me, your vehicle is waiting, he murmured discreetly, steering the dazed Ferengi toward a sleek black hover car at the edge of the tarmac. Ektor nodded numbly, barely registering the efficient way the sharply dressed human maneuvered him past the stunned onlookers and into the plush leather back seat. As the hover car lifted off, Ektor doubled over, clutching his head in his hands. I am Jack Hartford, your aide and liaison during your time on Earth, the man said gently as they merged into the orderly stream of aerial traffic leaving the spaceport. I know that was a challenging reception, but try not to be too discouraged. Adjusting to a new culture is always difficult at first. Ektor barely heard him over the sound of blood pounding in his ears. His thoughts raced in anguished circles, fixated on the centuries-old vase that had been reduced to dust because of his clumsiness. How could he possibly salvage relations with the humans after literally destroying a priceless Ferengi artifact right in front of their president? 
Lost in despair, Hector scarcely noticed the glittering cityscape whizzing by outside the hovercar windows. All his hopes of making a strong first impression had been dashed in the space of a single disastrous morning. As the vehicle finally touched down outside a squat concrete building, Hector glanced up to see Ferengi Embassy emblazoned across its featureless facade. The structure looked as dull and nondescript as a storage bunker, a far cry from the soaring glass towers Hector had hoped to impress the humans with. With a sinking heart, Hector watched as a gaggle of his lowly compatriots spilled out of the embassy to greet him, nearly tripping over each other in their haste. These shabby bureaucrats were apparently the best his cash-strapped government had seen fit to send to aid Hector in this hugely consequential assignment. Clearly, he would be the one doing the heavy lifting in these negotiations. As the Ferengi staffers swarmed him, peppering him with questions, a wave of nausea swept over Hector, nearly dropping him to his knees. The sheer magnitude of the task before him felt insurmountable in the face of his inauspicious debut, but he had no choice but to press on. The survival of his people could very well depend on him finding a way to redeem himself with Earth's daunting hegemon, no matter how thoroughly he seemed to keep putting his foot in it. With a wan smile pasted on his face, Hector allowed the excitable bureaucrats to shepherd him into the dingy embassy, painfully aware that his work was more than cut out for him. All he could do was pray that the evening's state dinner at the White House would provide him a chance to regain some much-needed goodwill from his formidable human hosts. Hector tossed and turned in his unfamiliar bed, the events of the disastrous reception playing on repeat in his mind. As the first rays of sunlight filtered through the embassy windows, he sat up with newfound tenacity. This was his chance to prove himself, to show the humans he was more than just a bumbling amateur. He found Jack waiting for him in the embassy's conference room, a steaming cup of coffee in hand. The human's steady gaze calmed Hector's frayed nerves. Ready for round two? Jack asked, sliding a tablet across the table. We've got a packed schedule today. Hector's eyes widened as he scrolled through the list of meetings. Defense contractors? Congressional leaders? Jack, I can barely string two human sentences together without mangling an idiom. You'll do fine, Jack assured him, leaning in. Let's go over some key points. For the next hour, Jack patiently coached Hector on human customs and talking points. With each passing minute, Hector felt a glimmer of confidence taking root. Their first stop was Quantum Dynamics, a leading defense contractor. Hector's palms grew clammy as he entered the sleek boardroom, faced with a table of stern-faced executives. Ambassador, a silver-haired woman began, her voice crisp. We have concerns about Ferengi manufacturing capabilities. How can you assure us your factories can meet our exacting standards? Hector opened his mouth, ready to stammer out an apologetic response. But then something clicked. He'd spent years as an engineer before entering diplomacy. This was his wheelhouse. Actually, he said, his voice steadier than he'd expected, Ferengi nanofabrication techniques are quite advanced. Let me walk you through our latest breakthroughs in molecular assembly. For the next 20 minutes, Hector held the room wrapped, effortlessly fielding technical questions. By the time he finished, the executives were nodding approvingly, their earlier skepticism replaced by genuine interest. Buoyed by this success, Hector entered his afternoon meeting with congressional leaders with renewed vigor. The hawkish politicians immediately pounced, grilling him on military commitments. The Ferengi alliance has always been more focused on commerce than warfare, Hector admitted. But consider the economic benefits of our partnership. Our trade routes could open up new markets for Earth goods, boosting your GDP by an estimated 12% within five years. He continued outlining potential areas of cooperation, drawing on the cultural lessons Jack had imparted. By the meeting's end, even the most hardline senators were grudgingly acknowledging the merits of his argument. As Hector climbed into the hovercar with Jack, he felt a weight lifting from his shoulders. Maybe he wasn't so outmatched after all. But his newfound confidence was immediately put to the test as Jack's communicator chirped urgently. The human's face grew grave as he listened to the message. We have a situation, Jack said, ending the call. A Ferengi freighter carrying medical supplies to one of our colonies has been hijacked by Breen pirates. They're demanding ransom. 
were being called to an emergency National Security Council meeting. Hector's stomach lurched as the hover car changed course, speeding towards the imposing edifice of the White House. This was the moment of truth. Could he rise to the challenge when it mattered most? Hector's heart raced as the hover car touched down at the White House. He followed Jack through a maze of corridors, mind whirling with potential strategies. As they entered the Situation Room, Hector was struck by the grim faces of Earth's top military brass and political leaders. Ambassador, President Chen nodded curtly, we're facing a crisis. The Breen are demanding 10 million credits and safe passage. Your thoughts? Hector took a deep breath, steeling himself. Madam President, if I may suggest an alternative approach, the Breen respect strength, but they also value profit. What if we offered them a deal they couldn't refuse? He outlined a plan to lure the pirates with the promise of advanced Ferengi technology, then spring a trap using a joint human-Ferengi strike team. The room fell silent as Hector finished speaking, then erupted in a flurry of discussion. Hours later, as the rescue operation unfolded successfully, Hector felt a surge of pride. He'd proven himself capable of handling a true crisis. In the days that followed, Hector threw himself into his diplomatic duties with renewed vigor. Jack, impressed by the ambassador's growing confidence, suggested they take a break to experience some human culture. Ever seen a football game? Jack asked with a grin. Before Hector knew it, he found himself in a sea of scarlet and gray, surrounded by thousands of screaming humans. The Ohio State-Michigan rivalry game was unlike anything he'd ever witnessed. Go Bucks! Jack shouted, his face painted in team colors. Hector flinched as the crowd roared, a massive cheer erupting when a player in a red jersey crossed a white line. I don't understand, Hector said, puzzled. Why are they so excited about someone running with an oddly shaped ball? Jack laughed, clapping him on the back. It's not about the ball, my friend. It's about pride, tradition, the thrill of competition. Just watch. You'll get it. As the game progressed, Hector found himself caught up in the electric atmosphere. He cheered when others cheered, groaned at missed opportunities, and by the final whistle, he was on his feet with the rest of the crowd, throat hoarse from yelling. The football game was just the beginning. Over the next few weeks, Jack took Hector on a whirlwind tour of New York City. They devoured slices of pizza so large they drooped off the plate, marveled at the towering skyscrapers, and wandered through Central Park's winding paths. One evening, they found themselves in the audience of The Late Show with Samantha Cho. Hector watched in fascination as the host effortlessly blended humor and biting social commentary. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Samantha announced with a flourish, please welcome our special guest, Ambassador Hector of the Ferengi Alliance. Hector froze, caught off guard. Jack gave him a gentle push, and suddenly he was walking onto the stage, bathed in bright lights and thunderous applause. So, Ambassador, Samantha began, her eyes twinkling mischievously, I hear you had quite the memorable first day on Earth. Care to share your thoughts on our planet so far? Hector hesitated, then decided to embrace the moment. Well, Samantha, he said, leaning in conspiratorially, I've learned that humans have a strange obsession with running after oddly shaped balls and that something called a hot dog contains neither canine nor excessive heat. The audience erupted in laughter, and Hector felt a rush of exhilaration. He bantered back and forth with Samantha, finding an unexpected knack for self-deprecating humor. As the days turned into weeks, Hector found himself settling into life on Earth. He began keeping a journal, meticulously documenting his experiences. Day 47 visited the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Humans have a peculiar habit of staring at flat images for hours. Jack insists it's culture, but I remain skeptical. Day 62, tried something called sushi, raw fish wrapped in seaweed and rice. Surprisingly delicious, though I fear for the state of human cooking technology. One evening, Jack took Hector to a small, dimly lit bar tucked away in a quiet corner of the city. There's someone I want you to meet, he said mysteriously. As they settled into a worn leather booth, a tall woman with piercing green eyes approached. Ambassador Hector, she said, extending her hand. I'm Alana Chen. I've done some work for your people in the past. 
Ektor fumbled with his drink, nearly spilling it as he shook her hand. Ah, yes, the aerospace engineer. Your work on plasma containment fields is quite impressive. Alana raised an eyebrow, a small smile playing at her lips. You've read my papers? Of course, Ektor replied, warming to the topic. Your theories on subspace field manipulation are revolutionary. In fact, I have some ideas on how we might apply Ferengi quantum tunneling techniques to enhance the efficiency. Before he knew it, hours had passed in animated discussion. Alana's quick wit and incisive intellect both challenged and excited Ektor. As the night wore on, their conversation ranged from theoretical physics to philosophy, with Jack occasionally chiming in with a wry observation. In the weeks that followed, Ektor found himself seeking out Alana's company more and more. They would meet for coffee, poring over scientific journals, and debating the finer points of warp field theory. He found her presence both stimulating and oddly comforting. Inspired by their discussions, Ektor began formulating an ambitious proposal. He spent long nights drafting plans, crunching numbers, and preparing presentations. Finally, he was ready to pitch his idea a joint human-Ferengi research initiative to develop a revolutionary hyperwarp drive. Ektor threw himself into lobbying and negotiations, leveraging his growing network of contacts. His passion and meticulous preparation paid off. After weeks of intense meetings, funding was secured for the project. As Ektor stood before the assembled team of elite scientists, both human and Ferengi, he felt a mix of pride and trepidation. Alana stood at his side, her presence reassuring. Together, Ektor began, his voice steady, we have the opportunity to push the boundaries of what's possible. Let's make history. The early days of the project were rocky. Cultural misunderstandings and communication barriers led to heated arguments and missed deadlines. Ektor found himself constantly mediating disputes, striving to find common ground. One particularly tense day, as tempers flared over a technical disagreement, Ektor called for a break. He gathered the team in the cafeteria, where he had arranged for a spread of both human and Ferengi cuisine. Before we're scientists, he said, gesturing to the eclectic mix of foods, we're people. Let's take a moment to learn about each other, to understand our different perspectives. Only then can we truly collaborate. Slowly as they shared meals and stories, barriers began to crumble. The team started to gel, each member bringing their unique strengths to the table. Ektor and Alana grew especially close, often working late into the night, bouncing ideas off each other. There was an undeniable chemistry between them, a spark that went beyond mere intellectual compatibility. Just as the team was on the verge of a breakthrough with the hyperwarp prototype, alarming news reached Earth. Tensions between the Dominion and Klingon Empire had reached a boiling point, threatening to erupt into full-scale war. Ektor's communicator buzzed with an urgent message from the Ferengi homeworld. His stomach dropped as he read the recall order. With the Alliance pledged to support Earth and the Federation, all Ferengi ships and personnel were being summoned home to secure supply lines and defensive positions. As Ektor stared at the message, heart pounding, Alana entered the lab. She took one look at his face and knew something was wrong. What is it? she asked, concern etching her features. Ektor looked up, his eyes meeting hers. I... I have to go back, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. The project. Everything we've worked for. Alana stepped closer, placing a hand on his arm. We'll figure something out, she said firmly. This is too important to abandon now. As they stood there, the weight of the looming conflict hanging over them, Ektor realized that his mission had become about far more than just diplomacy or scientific achievement. He had found a home here, forged connections that ran deep. Whatever came next, he knew he couldn't simply walk away. With tenacity, Ektor began formulating a plan. He would need to act quickly, balancing his duty to his people with his commitment to the project and to Alana. The coming days would test him like never before. But for the first time since arriving on Earth, Ektor felt truly ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. Ektor's communicator buzzed again, this time with an urgent summons. He glanced at Alana, his heart sinking. I have to go. Emergency meeting with Earth's military leadership. 
She nodded, her face a mask of concern. I'll hold down the fort here. Go. Hector raced through the corridors, his mind whirling. When he arrived at the briefing room, he found it buzzing with tense activity. General Braxton, a stern-faced woman with close-cropped gray hair, stood at the head of the table. Ambassador, she said, her voice clipped. The situation has escalated. We're on the brink of war between the Dominion and the Klingon Empire. Hector felt the blood drain from his face as Braxton outlined the crisis. Maps and strategic projections flashed on the screens around them, painting a grim picture of the galaxy's future. Ambassador, Braxton said, fixing Hector with an intense look. You're being recalled to Ferenginar immediately. Your people need to coordinate their response. Hector's stomach lurched. But General, the hyperwarp project, we're so close to a breakthrough. Surely I can... I'm sorry, Braxton cut him off. This takes precedence. You leave in two hours. Hector's mind raced as he returned to the lab. How could he leave now, with everything hanging in the balance? The team gathered around him, faces etched with worry as he broke the news. Alana pulled him aside, her green eyes shimmering. We'll keep working, she said fiercely. We won't give up. Hector nodded, unable to speak past the lump in his throat. He embraced her tightly, breathing in her familiar scent one last time. Jack met him at the landing pad, his usual jovial demeanor subdued. I wish it didn't have to be like this, he said, clasping Hector's shoulder. Neither do I, my friend, Hector replied. But know this, I will do everything in my power to ensure our peoples stand together, no matter what comes. Jack nodded, his eyes suspiciously bright. Give him hell, Ambassador. The sleek Ferengi transport lifted off, Earth's vibrant blue sphere shrinking beneath them. Hector stared out the viewport, his reflection overlaid on the receding planet. How much had changed since he first arrived, viewing this world with suspicion and fear? Now leaving felt like tearing away a piece of himself. The journey to Ferenginar passed in a blur of anxiety and strategic planning. When they touched down on the perpetually rainy world, Hector was whisked away to the Grand Nagus's palace. The circular chamber was packed with agitated Ferengi officials, their voices rising in a cacophony of argument. Hector took his place at the table, keenly aware of the weight of responsibility on his shoulders. The Alliance must remain neutral, one minister shouted. We cannot risk our profit margins in a war between Federation and Dominion. And what of our defense pact? Hector countered, his voice steady. We stand to gain far more through continued partnership with Earth and the Federation. The debate raged for hours. Hector drew on every ounce of his newfound diplomatic skill, deftly parrying objections and building consensus. He painted a vivid picture of the scientific and economic possibilities that lay ahead if they stood by their allies. In the end, his arguments won out. The Ferengi would provide material and resource support to the Federation without committing to direct military engagement. It wasn't everything Hector had hoped for, but it was a start. As the gathering dispersed, the Grand Nagus approached. Impressive work, Ambassador, he said, his wrinkled face unreadable. Your unique perspective will be invaluable in the days ahead. I'm appointing you to the wartime advisory cabinet. Hector bowed, a mix of pride and trepidation washing over him. I am honored to serve your excellency. In the weeks that followed, Hector threw himself into his new role. He pored over intelligence reports, attended strategy sessions, and pushed ceaselessly for greater Ferengi involvement. But each night as he stared out at Ferenginar's driving rain, his thoughts turned to Earth, to Jack's easy laughter and steadfast friendship, to Alana's brilliant mind and the spark between them left unexplored. As news of the escalating conflict filtered in, Hector's worry grew. How many human lives hung in the balance? How many worlds teetered on the edge of destruction? He redoubled his efforts, arguing passionately for increased resource commitments to the Federation. In quiet moments, he even began drafting proposals for Ferengi troop deployments, a radical notion that would have been unthinkable just months ago. But as the maelstrom of war engulfed more and more of the galaxy, Hector couldn't shake the feeling that he was needed elsewhere, that his true place was not in the safety of Ferenginar's war rooms, but out there, 
alongside the humans he had come to admire and respect. One evening, as he sat in his office drafting yet another report, a priority message flashed across his screen. His heart's raced as he recognized the sender, Alana. With trembling fingers, Hector opened the transmission, wondering what urgent news could have prompted her to risk interstellar communication in the midst of war. Hector's heart's raced as he opened Alana's message. Her face appeared on the screen, strain evident in the tight lines around her eyes. Hector, I hope this reaches you. We've made a breakthrough on the hyperwarp drive, but... She glanced over her shoulder, her voice dropping. The Dominion's pushing harder. Earth needs more support. I know you're doing what you can, but... The transmission cut out, replaced by static. Hector's fists clenched. He couldn't stand idle any longer. In the days that followed, Hector became a whirlwind of activity. He navigated the labyrinthine Ferengi bureaucracy with newfound grit, brokering deals and redirecting resources. Trade agreements that once took months to finalize were hammered out in days. You're proposing we divert 30% of our privateer fleet to Federation shipyards? A portly minister sputtered, waving a piad. That's preposterous. Hector leaned forward, his voice low and intense. It's an investment. If the Dominion wins, who will we trade with? Think of the long-term profits. Slowly, grudgingly, the resources began to flow. But it wasn't enough. The comm chimed. Jack's haggard face filled the screen. Hector, we're getting pummeled out here. The Seventh Fleet just got decimated in the Tyra system. We need boots on the ground, not just supplies. Hector's stomach churned. Ferengi don't fight other people's wars, Jack. You know that. Then we'll lose this one, and your people will be next. The words hung in the air long after the transmission ended. Hector paced his office, mind racing. What he was considering went against centuries of Ferengi doctrine. But the humans had changed him. He couldn't abandon them now. He strode into the Grand Nagus's chamber, chin high. Your Excellency, I have a proposal. The debate raged for hours. Voices rose to shouts, faces flushed with outrage. But Hector held firm, countering every argument with cold logic and impassioned pleas. In the end, he prevailed. A small force, barely a battalion, but it was a start. As the first Ferengi troops prepared for deployment, Hector's calm chirped. His blood ran cold as he read the message. Alana's ship ambushed. All hands lost. He staggered, clutching his table for support. The room spun. It couldn't be true. Not Alana. Not after everything. Grief threatened to overwhelm him, but Hector pushed it down. There would be time to mourn later. Now there was work to do. He threw himself into negotiations with renewed fervor. Each deal, each concession became a tribute to Alana's memory. When he brokered the transfer of experimental cloaking technology to human fleets, he imagined her brilliant mind dissecting the specs, improving them. Encrypted transmissions with Jack became a lifeline. Together, they coordinated strikes against Dominion supply lines, exploiting the shared strengths of their peoples. We've got them on the back foot, Jack reported, a glimmer of hope in his tired eyes. But they're regrouping. Intelligence says they're planning something big. Hector nodded grimly. We'll be ready. The warning came too late. Dominion forces surged toward Earth in overwhelming numbers. Hector's command ship raced to join the defense, emerging from warp into chaos. The view screen filled with explosive flashes as ships traded fire. Entire squadrons winked out of existence in seconds. Hector barked orders, coordinating Ferengi formations with the human fleet. Dominion ships breaching the perimeter, a sensor officer shouted. They're launching boarding parties. Hector's hearts pounded. This was it. If Earth fell, all was lost. Suddenly, a familiar voice crackled over the comm. This is Commander Chen of the Earth Defense Force. We've got borders on the ground, but we're holding the line. Request immediate reinforcement. Hector froze. It couldn't be, but he knew that voice. Alana, he whispered. As if in answer, a battered Federation runabout screamed past the view screen, guns blazing. For a moment, Hector glimpsed a shock of red hair in the pilot's seat. Hope surged through him. Alana was alive. Earth still stood. 
and he would be damned if he'd let either fall now. All ships, Hector commanded, his voice steady and sure, move to support Earth's defenses. Today, we fight as one. Bun! Hector's voice rang out clear and strong, carrying across the bridge of the Ferengi flagship. The battle for Earth had been won, but at a staggering cost. As the smoke cleared and damage reports flooded in, Hector knew this was only the beginning. He turned to face the assembled Ferengi commanders, their faces etched with a mix of exhaustion and newfound perseverance. We've proven our worth as allies, Hector said, gesturing to the view screen where Federation ships still held their defensive formation around Earth. Now we must see this through to the end. In the days that followed, Hector threw himself into a whirlwind of strategy sessions and negotiations. He argued passionately for full Ferengi involvement in the coming counteroffensive, countering every objection with razor-sharp logic and appeals to long-term profit potential. Think of the trade routes we'll control, he urged a group of hesitant ministers. The resources of a hundred worlds, ripe for the taking, but only if we strike now while the Dominion is on its heels. Slowly, grudgingly, the alliance fell in line. Ferengi shipyards hummed with activity as mothballed warships were recommissioned and privateer fleets repurposed for military action. When the massive Allied Armada finally assembled, it was a sight to behold. Sleek Federation cruisers flew alongside angular Klingon birds of prey and the distinctive saucer-shaped Ferengi marauders. Hector stood on the bridge of the Ferengi flagship, heart swelling with pride as he surveyed the fleet. Set course for Cardassia Prime, he ordered. Maximum warp. The journey passed in a blur of tactical briefings and last-minute preparations. Hector found himself constantly in demand, his unique insights into Dominion psychology proving invaluable as they fine-tuned their battle plans. When they dropped out of warp in the Cardassian system, chaos erupted. The Dominion had amassed its remaining forces for a desperate last stand. Energy beams lanced across the void of space as the two fleets clashed in a titanic engagement. Hector barked orders, coordinating Ferengi attack wings with practiced efficiency. On the main view screen, he watched Federation ships execute precision strike maneuvers he had helped develop. Orbital defenses are weakening, a tactical officer reported. Ground invasion forces are greenlit for deployment. Hector's hearts raced. This was the moment of truth. He turned to his second-in-command. You have the bridge. I'm joining the ground assault. Ignoring the shocked protests of his staff, Hector made his way to the transporter room. He checked the charge on his disruptor pistol, then nodded to the transporter chief. Energize. The surface of Cardassia Prime materialized around him in a haze of smoke and weapons fire. Ferengi Marines were already engaged in fierce street-to-street -street combat pushing towards the towering spires of the capital's citadel district. Hector fell in with a squad of soldiers, his diplomatic robes incongruous amidst their battle armor. They fought their way through narrow alleys and bombed-out buildings, Dominion troops contesting every meter of ground. A sudden explosion rocked the street. When the dust settled, Hector found himself the highest-ranking officer left standing. Without hesitation, he took command, rallying the shaken troops. We push for the citadel, he shouted over the din of battle. Use the rubble for cover. Watch for snipers in the upper floors. As they advanced, Hector's mind raced. Traditional Ferengi tactics wouldn't work here. He needed to think differently. You and you, he pointed to a pair of soldiers. I need volunteers for a special mission. Under cover of darkness, Hector led a small team through the city's ancient sewer system. They emerged behind Dominion lines, catching the defenders completely off guard. A series of precisely placed explosive charges brought down key defensive emplacements, allowing the main Allied force to finally breach the Citadel's outer walls. The fighting only intensified as they pushed deeper into the heart of Dominion power. Hector's ears rang from the constant weapons fire, his lungs burning from the acrid smoke. Rounding a corner, they stumbled upon a group of human soldiers pinned down by heavy fire. Without thinking, Hector sprinted from cover, laying down suppressing fire as he dragged the wounded to safety. Damn, sir, one of the humans gasped, recognizing Hector's rank insignia. I never thought I'd owe my life to a Ferengi. Hector managed a grim smile. 
There's a first time for everything, soldier. Days blurred together as they fought block by block, room by room. Hector lost track of how many times he narrowly cheated death. But finally, inevitably, the Dominion's grip on the city began to crumble. When the last pockets of resistance fell silent, Hector found himself standing in the shattered remains of the Dominion's central command center. The air was thick with ozone and the copper tang of spilled blood. Around him, soldiers from a dozen worlds celebrated, their joyous shouts echoing off broken walls. A Federation admiral approached, extending his hand. Ambassador Hector, your presence is requested at the surrender ceremony. You've more than earned your place at that table. As Hector made his way to the impromptu command post, he caught sight of a familiar shock of red hair. Alana stood amidst a group of human officers, her uniform scorched and torn. Their eyes met across the rubble-strewn plaza. For a moment, the chaos of the past weeks faded away, leaving only the promise of a hard-won future. Hector squared his shoulders and strode forward. There was still work to be done. The acrid smell of smoke and ozone lingered in Hector's nostrils as he stepped off the transport onto Ferengi soil. The spaceport bustled with activity, a far cry from the eerie silence that had gripped Cardassia Prime in the wake of the invasion. A crowd had gathered, held back by barriers and security personnel. As Hector emerged, a roar went up. Cheers, applause, and the distinctive Ferengi cry of, Prophet! echoed across the landing pad. Hector blinked, momentarily overwhelmed. This was unexpected. Ambassador, a voice cut through the din. Grand Nagus Rom pushed through the throng, his elaborate headpiece wobbling precariously. Welcome home, hero of the Alliance. Before Hector could respond, Rom clasped his hand, raising it high for the crowd to see. Behold, the Nagas cried, the Ferengi who saved Earth. The cheering redoubled. Hector's ears twitched uncomfortably at the onslaught of noise. I thank you, Your Excellency, he managed, but I was merely one part of a much larger effort. Rom chuckled leading Hector towards a waiting hovercar. Always so modest. Come, we have much to discuss. As they sped through the streets of the capital, Hector marveled at the changes. Everywhere, view screens displayed footage from the Battle of Cardassia. Ferengi Marines fought alongside humans and Klingons. And there, unmistakable in his civilian robes, was Hector himself leading the charge. The people are inspired, Rom said, following Hector's gaze. They see a new future for our people, one where profit and principles can coexist. Hector nodded slowly, mind racing. And you support this vision? Rom's expression grew serious. More than support it, I intend to make it reality, with your help, of course. The next weeks passed in a whirlwind of meetings, debates, and negotiations. Hector found himself at the center of a political maelstrom championing sweeping reforms that would transform Ferengi society. This is madness, thundered Minister Blunt, his jowls quivering with outrage. You would have us abandon centuries of tradition for... what? Some human notion of cooperation? Hector stood his ground, voice steady. I would have us secure our future. The galaxy is changing. We must change with it or be left behind. Slowly, painstakingly, the coalition took shape. Progressive voices, long silenced, found new courage. Even some conservatives, seeing the potential for profit in new interstellar markets, grudgingly came on board. The day the reforms passed, Hector stood on the balcony of the Tower of Commerce, gazing out at the sprawling city below. A hand clasped his shoulder. He turned to find Rom, a rare smile on his face. Well done, my friend, the Nagus said. Now comes the real challenge. The Federation will need a strong Ferengi voice, someone who understands both worlds. Hector's eyes widened as realization dawned. You mean... Rom nodded. Congratulations, Ambassador Plenipotentiary. The journey to Earth was a homecoming of sorts. As the sleek Ferengi diplomatic vessel dropped out of warp, the blue-green orb filled the viewscreen. Hector's hearts quickened. Ferengi One, you are cleared for approach, came the crisp voice of Space Dock Control. Welcome to Earth, Ambassador. The docking procedures complete, Ektor strode down the gangway, 
A small welcoming committee awaited him. His breath caught as he recognized a familiar face. Alana, he breathed. She stepped forward, her smile radiant. Welcome back, Hector. Or should I say, Mr. Ambassador? Before he could respond, another figure pushed through the crowd. Hector, you magnificent bastard! Jack enveloped him in a crushing embrace. I knew you'd be back. As the friends caught up, Hector couldn't help but feel a sense of rightness. This, he realized, was where he belonged. A bridge between two worlds, forging a path to a shared future. The next months were a blur of negotiations, cultural exchanges, and delicate diplomatic maneuvering. Hector found himself constantly challenged, drawing on every ounce of his experience to navigate the complexities of integrating Ferengi interests with Federation ideals. The issue isn't just economic, he explained to a panel of skeptical diplomats. It's cultural. We need to find ways to celebrate our differences while building on our common ground. Progress was slow but steady. With each small victory, the dream of a truly united galaxy seemed to draw closer. On the eve of the Federation charter signing, Hector paced his quarters aboard the massive orbital habitat. The weight of history pressed down on him. Tomorrow would change everything. A chime at the door interrupted his reverie. Enter, he called. The door slid open, revealing a face he hadn't seen in years. Gallic, his old political rival, stood framed in the doorway. The other Ferengi's expression was a mask of barely suppressed fury. So, Gallic spat, this is what it's come to. The great Ector, ready to sell out his people for a pat on the head from the humans. Ector's eyes narrowed. What do you want, Gallic? The other Ferengi stepped closer, voice low and dangerous. I want you to understand what's at stake. This federation of yours, it's the end of everything we are. Our sovereignty, our way of life. It's progress, Hector countered, a chance for something greater. Gallic's laugh was bitter. Progress? Is that what you call it? He leaned in, his breath hot on Hector's face. Listen closely. You have until morning to withdraw Ferenginar's support for this charter. If you don't, well, let's just say the signing ceremony might not go as smoothly as you hope. Before Hector could respond, Gallic was gone, leaving only the echo of his threat hanging in the air. Hector's mind raced. He had to act, had to warn someone. But who could he trust? As if in answer, his comm unit chirped. Alana's face appeared on the screen. Hector, is everything all right? You look pale. He took a deep breath. Alana, I need your help. We have a problem. We have a situation, Hector said, his voice low and urgent. He quickly relayed Gallic's threat to Alana, watching her expression shift from concern to perseverance. I'll alert security, she said. We need to sweep the entire habitat for... A distant explosion cut her off, the habitat shuddering around them. Klaxons blared as emergency lighting bathed the room in an eerie red glow. Too late, Hector growled. He snatched up his personal comm unit. We need to get to the council chambers. Now. They raced through chaos-filled corridors, dodging panicked diplomats and security personnel. Hector's hearts pounded as they neared their destination. The massive doors to the council chamber stood ajar, acrid smoke billowing from within. Inside, they found Jack coordinating a response team. His face was smudged with soot, but his eyes blazed with intensity. Hector, thank the stars you're all right. We've got multiple breaches, but it looks like the main target was... The Charter, Hector finished grimly. He surveyed the damaged chamber, noting the shattered display case where the historic document had been moments from ratification. In the days that followed, as cleanup efforts began and investigations were launched, Hector found himself thrust into the center of a political maelstrom. He worked tirelessly to salvage the fragile alliance, his willpower only strengthened by the attack. Years passed. The United Federation of Planets weathered its turbulent birth, emerging stronger for the trials it had faced. Hector, now a respected elder statesman, had settled into his role as Ferengi ambassador on Earth with a hard-won sense of accomplishment. One crisp autumn morning, Hector stood before a class of eager young diplomats at Starfleet Academy. He was midway through a lecture on cross-species negotiation when his comm unit chirped urgently. 
Ambassador, a breathless aide's voice crackled. You're needed in the emergency council chambers immediately. Hector's stomach clenched. He hadn't heard that particular tone of barely controlled panic since. He pushed the thought aside, making quick apologies to his students before hurrying out. In the council chambers, he found a grim-faced Jack waiting. The years had turned his friend's hair silver, but his eyes were as sharp as ever. It's happening again, Hector, Jack said without preamble. Uprisings across Ferengi space. Colonies in open revolt. They're calling for a return to the old ways. Hector's mind raced. Gallic? Jack nodded. Him and others like him. They've been building support for years, right under our noses. Casperia Prime is the epicenter, but reports are coming in from a dozen worlds. Show me, Hector demanded. Holographic displays flickered to life, revealing scenes of chaos. Hector's heart sank as he saw the capital of Casperia Prime in flames, loyalist forces overwhelmed by well-armed insurgents. I need a ship, Hector said, his voice hard, and a security team. We're going to Casperia Prime. Jack raised an eyebrow. You can't be serious. It's too dangerous. We should... No, Hector cut him off. This is my fight, my people. I started us down this road, and I'll be damned if I let some reactionary thugs undo everything we've built. Hours later, Hector stood on the bridge of a sleek Federation runabout, hurtling through warp towards the embattled colony. Beside him, a young human officer, Marcus Bowers, studied tactical readouts with a furrowed brow. Sir, Bowers said, looking up, we're receiving a distress call from the Ferengi loyalist commander on Casperia Prime. The capital has fallen. They're requesting immediate evac. Hector's fist tight. Denied. Tell them to hold their positions. We're coming in hot. As they dropped out of warp, the devastation became apparent. The once gleaming towers of Casperia Prime's capital were scarred and burning. Hector's eyes narrowed as he spotted the distinctive silhouettes of Ferengi marauders in low orbit, exchanging fire with beleaguered Federation vessels. Get us planet side, Hector ordered. I need to see this for myself. The runabout streaked through the atmosphere, dodging sporadic weapons fire. As they neared the ground, Hector caught glimpses of pitched battles in the streets below. His people, tearing themselves apart, they sat down on the outskirts of the industrial district, the ship's shields barely holding against a barrage of small arms fire. Hector strapped on a tactical vest, checking the charge on his phaser. Stay close, he told Bowers and the security team. We're heading for the central admin complex. If we can retake that, we might just have a chance. As they stepped out into the acrid smoke and chaos of Casperia Prime, Hector's grit hardened. This world, this future, was worth fighting for and he would see it secured, whatever it takes. Decades passed, and Hector found himself standing before a sea of faces at his 50th anniversary celebration as Ferengi ambassador to the Federation. The Grand Hall of Unity on Earth sparkled with holographic displays chronicling his storied career. And so it is my distinct honor to present Ambassador Hector with the Federation's Celestial Star of Peace, announced President Talara her wizened Vulcan features betraying a hint of warmth. Hector ascended the stage, his movements slower but still possessing the vitality that had driven him for so long. As the gleaming medallion settled around his neck, he gazed out at the assembled dignitaries, humans, Klingons, and Dorians, and yes, a sea of familiar Ferengi faces, all united in celebration. My friends, Hector began, his voice carrying easily through the hall, when I first took up this mantle, many doubted that Ferenginar and the Federation could truly find common ground. Yet here we stand, half a century later, stronger together than we ever were apart. Applause rippled through the crowd. In the front row, Alana beamed up at him, her hand resting on his empty seat. Beside her, Jack, now sporting a distinguished shock of white hair, nodded approvingly. As the festivities continued into the night, Hector found himself cornered by a group of younger diplomats, their eyes shining with admiration. Ambassador, one of them, a Tellarite, ventured, What do you make of these reports about the Nth? Should we be worried? Hector's expression darkened momentarily. Let's not mar this evening with talk of... 
An urgent chirp from his comm badge interrupted him. Ambassador Hector, your presence is required in the emergency council chambers immediately. The next morning, Hector stood before the Federation Security Council, his heart's heavy. President Talara's face was etched with lines of concern as she delivered the grim news. The nth vessel was completely destroyed, she said, her voice steady despite the gravity of the situation. All hands lost. Our analysts believe this was a deliberate act of aggression. Admiral Carr, a grizzled Klingon, smacked his fist on the table. Then we must strike back. Show these nth vermin the might of our combined fleets. Hector felt the weight of countless lives pressing down upon him. He closed his eyes, took a deep breath, and spoke. No, we cannot meet violence with violence, not against an enemy we barely understand. Shocked murmurs rippled through the chamber. Are you suggesting capitulation? The Andorian representative asked, antennae twitching in agitation. I'm suggesting we explore every possible avenue for peace, Hector countered. A war with the Nth could devastate us all. We must attempt negotiations, no matter how slim the chance of success. But his words fell on deaf ears. As the council devolved into heated debate, Hector realized his voice, once so influential, now carried little weight in the face of this new threat. Days later, Hector stood before the Federation Grand Council, his resignation speech heavy on his tongue. The chambers were packed, faces ranging from sympathetic to openly hostile. For fifty years I have worked to bring our peoples together, he began, his voice thick with emotion. I have seen firsthand the miracles we can achieve through cooperation and understanding. But now, as we face our greatest challenge, I fear we are abandoning those very principles that have made us strong. He paused, surveying the room. Jack sat stone-faced in the human delegation. Alana watched from the gallery, her eyes brimming with tears. I cannot, in good conscience, support a war that I believe will lead only to unimaginable suffering, Hector continued. The Nth possess technological capabilities far beyond our own. Any conflict with them risks becoming a war of annihilation. I implore you, consider the unthinkable. Seek terms of surrender before it's too late. The chamber erupted in outrage. Shouts of coward and traitor echoed off the vaulted ceiling. Hector stood firm, even as he felt the bonds of friendship and respect he'd cultivated over a lifetime begin to crumble. As he left the council chambers for the last time, Alana fell into step beside him. I don't agree with you, she said softly, but I won't abandon you. Hector nodded gratefully, his heart's aching. Together they boarded her scout ship, leaving behind a federation preparing for war. In the quiet of deep space, Hector pored over what little information they had on the Nth. He compiled his memoirs, desperate to preserve some record of all they had achieved, all that now stood on the brink of destruction. The comm unit crackled to life, interrupting his somber reflections. Hector! Alana's voice was tight with fear. You need to see this. He rushed to the bridge, his breath catching in his throat as he took in the sight before them. An endless armada of nth vessels filled the viewscreen, their alien geometries defying description. Each ship dwarfed the largest Federation dreadnought, jam-packed with weapons beyond comprehension. It's already begun, Alana whispered, gripping Hector's hand. As they watched the nth fleet approach, Hector felt the weight of his failures pressing down upon him. All his life's work, all the bridges he had built between cultures, seemed to crumble in the face of this implacable foe. I was a fool, he rasped, staring into the abyss of oblivion descending upon them all. I should have listened to my fears. The Nth ships loomed ever closer, their very presence a stark reminder of how little they truly understood about the vast, often hostile universe. Hector's mind raced, searching desperately for some solution, some way to salvage hope from the jaws of annihilation. You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel. And for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.